Hello there. It's James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Johnny Test. Fred Flintstone. And one of my personal favorites, Leonardo. And you are listening to Epic Tales from the Sewer. It's totally awesome. Turtle power. Go, go, go. Ronin, The Lost Years, Issue Number 4. Writers, Kevin Eastman and Tom Waltz. Then, Pencils, S.L. Gallant, Inks by Maria Keene. Now, Pencils and Inks by Ben Bishop. Splinter's Journal, Kevin Eastman. Colorist, Luis Antonio Delgado. Letterer, Sean Lee. We start out, looks like Thunderdome from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. It's a giant dome that is metal and uh, looks like uh, the Ronin is fighting for his life. Ukraine, then. Kill or be killed. See, it looks like he's a gladiator. Then. With his pursuit of peace was upended by the infamous warlord called Deathworm, Michelangelo picked up his weapons and embarked on a path of vengeance. While tracking Deathworm's forces across Asia, Michelangelo was exposed to a nuclear radiation, causing him to temporarily lose his sight. With the help of a newfound family, he turned his weakness into strength. And just when peace seemed like a possibility, Deathworm struck again, ripping away the hero's home. Now, Casey Marie's young turtles have grown in stature and ability, each being an accomplished fighter in their own right. But the pre-teenage mutant ninja turtles are still susceptible to the follies of youth. Now, New York City. You can see it looks like there's two singes. One gets taken out by Odin, one gets taken out by Moya. We can see it looks like someone's watching them through their uh, binoculars. And it just happens to be that it's Yi. Yi tries to pick a lock on the door using some delicate lock picks. Okay, forget this. They're taking way too long, says Uno. What the? says Moya as Uno jumps and jump kicks the door open. Ksh! Yeah! Uno! Gets hit with some paintball guns right in the head. Ugh! Gah! Eek! Huh! Bang, 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 bang. You're all dead, says Casey Marie as she's holding a paintball gun. Smoking still from the last shot. Owie! Says Odin. Jeez, paintballs really sting! Nice going, Uno. You were supposed to have our back. Cool it, Moya. I'll handle this. You other kids, grab the singes and get cleaned up. We're done for training today. There's a dummy of April tied up in the chair that they're trying to rescue. Looks like old times. Casey Marie, who's in her um, battle outfit with a mask painted on, says to them, Aw, oh, this one lost his head. It's only a mannequin, Odie. Still, poor guy. Oh, brother. It's Moya and Yi try to console Odin. You can see that they've gotten quite big. They're definitely larger than they were last issue. You okay? Casey Marie says to, to Uno, I... I guess so. Moya's right. Your job was rear security. You were easy kills and you blew your cover. But if you'd stayed in position, we'd still be alive. Well, you would have had a fighting chance at least, she says. He looks pretty forlorn. It's just, it felt like the others were going too slow. And I just figured I could get up inside quicker and stop the bad guys and save the hostage. Instead, the bad guy stopped you, said Casey Marie. Listen. I know how hard it is to stay out of the action, kid. I've been there, done that. Back when we were invading Roosevelt Island to fight Stockman, I saw Master Michelangelo. He was in trouble, so I broke from his plan to help him out. I saved him, but he told me something I never forgot. I thought I told you to stay put. You did. I didn't, she says to the Ronin. Terrible discipline. Excellent initiative. Don't do it again. Understood? Yes, Sensei, she says. But I didn't understand. Not at first. But after a while, I realized what he meant. Even after I saved him, I could have put the other resistance soldiers in danger. I was supposed to be leading and protecting them, and I totally lucked out that none of them got killed when I took off to help Sensei. You're our best fighter, Uno. You've been a natural since you were little, and you're brave as hell. But you gotta learn how to be a better teammate. Your brother and sisters were handling things on their end. Moya and Odin took out the singes, and Yi was going to open the door. She's a whiz with her gadgets. 
and they were all counting on you to have their sixes. He's looking down and he's kind of upset. And by not trusting them to do their jobs, and by not doing yours, you let the entire team down, including yourself. Master Splinter talks about sacrifice a lot in his journal, and I think that's what it takes to be a good teammate and a good leader, especially when you're the best at what you do. Learning how to sacrifice your ego, knowing when to lead from the front, and when to let others take the lead. Understood? She says. Yes, Sensei. Good. Now let's go get with the rest of the team. And don't forget the hostage. As she has uh, April O'Neil's dummy in her hands. He lumps it over the shoulder, laughing a little bit. We don't want Odin to get too worried about her. Master Splinter's journal. The temple of pain, the mind and body, can overcome all. Great achievement is usually born of great sacrifice, and is never the result of selfishness. Napoleon Hill. Then, back in Thunderdome. How can I allow myself to do this? And so it's come to this, my friends. The grand finale. After nearly three years of non-stop bloodshed inside these damn cages, after all the carnage, the fight to end all fights, a battle royale for the ages. After surviving all that, how can I allow myself to kill my only friend, my blood brother? Only two warriors remain. The Turtle Titan, last of the monsters in the spectacular Shaka, heroic human companion. We see that he looks on to his friend. His friend is uh, looks like he's in sort of an African garb. He's got uh, dark brown skin and black hair, and he's wearing sort of a, uh, looks like a Zulu war prince sort of outfit. You know the stakes, lads and lasses. Freedom for the victor, death for the loser. Kill or be killed! How can I not? He says, looking on, as both of them look up at their captors. With a megaphone shouting at these people. I've already lost so much more than I can handle. It's time, Michelangelo. We must see this through, he says. For my brothers. Now it shows a recap of the turtles when they passed away. Raphael, with the sigh floating down in his lifeless body fly floating in the water. Leonardo, after the explosion, just covered with refuse and while there's fire all around him. Donatello, just littered with arrows. Master Splinter the same, both dead in the snow. My real brothers, my father... My closest friends? He thinks that April's dead. Fugitoids destroyed, and you can see uh, where it looks like a brick wall fell on Casey after the explosion. And a precious little heart sister. He sees the girl that was helping him out, that uh, was shot in the last issue. But I've made my choice. Too late to stop it now, as they run towards each other. Ready to fight. Too late. Story of my life. We see Michelangelo, Donatello, Leonardo, and Casey where uh, Karai last fought Raphael. Looks like they were about to go into the water to get his body. Too late. Story of my life. Too late for Raf. Too late for Leo. Casey Jones. April O'Neil, the Fugitoid. Donnie, Master Splinter. Too late for sweet, innocent Geralt. Even when I tried to escape the tragedies that plagued me, I was too late to get away. There were always more troubles waiting for me. Nine years, no matter how far I ran, no matter where I ran to. The mountains. We see him fighting up in the mountains. The sea. Fighting the pirates on the ship. The wastelands. Taking someone out in the uh, Korean city. And the troubles found me. When he was captured, when he was electrocuted with a taser. And for all that time, the troubles had the same name. Death Worm. As he looks on to a man who has Death Worm tattooed on his forearm. A name without a face. Relentless. They show what happened after he was uh, stunned, and he gets picked up and shackled and put into the back of a, tr of a truck. Haunting, like a ghost in the dark. Back to his brothers now as he's captured. Well, that was awful. That poor little girl. You let them get the jump on you, Mike. You know better than that, says Ghost Leo. No kidding. Rookie mistake, bro. Shut up. Please, just shut up. As he's sitting there crying. For a long while, I had to keep me company while the sounds of the wheels and turning engines rumbling, the darkness, and my failures. He looks on, and now, besides his three brothers, you could see the shambled corpse of Fugitoid. Casey hugging April, Master Splinter with arrows sticking out of him, and now young Geralt. All his hallucinations. By the time we stopped, I was hungry, thirsty, and too weak to put up a fight. You! Out! says one of them. Not that I had one left in me. As they kick him out and throw him to the ground... I figured it was just a matter of time until the bastards were going to kill me. And once again, like all those years ago in Hokkaido Mountains, I was ready to die. 
Well, well, you're quite the specimen, aren't ye? A desert tortoise if I've ever saw one. What? He hears a voice and looks on. I couldn't have been more wrong on both counts. I thought there'd be no more surprises for me when it came to your kind. Tis grand to be mistaken sometimes, eh? My name's Abigail Finn, sort of a punk-looking woman who has a feather hanging down from her left ear, longish hair and a mullet, and very muscular arms. That's Boss Finn to you, freak, says one gun-toting fool. She has a black lipstick, an eyebrow ring, a nose ring, and uh, dark sunglasses on. Aye, I'm the boss here. That's sure. Welcome to my training facilities. And don't let the sandy beach and baby blue waters fool ye. For here, there be monsters. You can see now there's a whole line of mutants. There's uh, one that looks like a crab, and one looks like a mole and a bat. Just kind of a whole line of them, like animal mutates. Present company included... You manky green beast, pointing at his face. Someone grabs him from behind. Get that thing cleaned up and chipped, boys. I want properly secured and smelling like a rose before we commence with the dirty work. As they drag him away. The dirty work. Wouldn't be long until I found out what she meant. But only after I was yoked. We see that they put microchips in him with, with some sort of uh, hypodermic needle as the doctor does it. Microbomb freak, right next to your carotid artery, remotely activated, so if you think about running, think again. Be a short run, I promise. And soaked, as they blast him with a hose. Kind of humiliating. Gah! What's the matter? I thought you turtles loved water. Now get some beauty rest. You're gonna need it, as they push him into a chain link fence cage. And then, left to the monsters. All of the monsters and mutants just happen to be in this cage with him. Monsters. No meat for the grinder, says this kind of a porcupine-looking guy. Don't look so tough, says another one who's kind of a cyclops with vertical eyes. Monsters like me. Carol, I'm sorry, as he breaks down and starts crying. A voice says, A bit of advice, bra. Any weakness you show now will not be forgiven in the cage, says the man from the very beginning panel, the uh, Zulu warrior sort of gentleman. I should have ignored him. Isn't this the cage? No, this is the home, and where we train in the cage, we fight. I keep my mouth shut. I'm done fighting. Then I suppose you're done living, because the only reason you're still breathing now is so that you can fight later, and you would not have been brought to this place if you were not a fighter. Which means you still have this choice. Sit here and give up. I could have saved myself so much more pain to come. Or well, stand up and fight, he says, reaching to Ronan. He looks up. Instead, a noble choice. My name is Shaka. Michelangelo, as they reach through the fence to shake hands. I made a friend. Well, Michelangelo, unlike Boss Finn and her lackeys, allow me to give you a proper welcome to your new home. My new home turned out to be somewhere in Kazakhstan, an old beach resort converted into some kind of twisted gladiator training camp. Apartheid is in full effect, as you can see. Boss Finn has us separated into two groups. Humans, we show the humans in their orange jumpsuits, and other, and both sides seem to be identically lifting weights and working out. Mutants. Pardon? It's what they were called, things like me. Ah, understood. And by your accent, I reckon you're American, too. How did you end up here, brah? Long story. What were you saying about cage fighting? It's why we're all prisoners here, forced to fight one another to the death for sport and profit. Forced? How? By the way of those damned micro-explosives they tagged us all with. Only way of getting out of this hellhole is by winning Boss Finn's tournament. You lose in the cage, you die. Refuse to fight, you die. From the looks of things, I'm guessing Boss Finn isn't the real big boss of all this. Oh, you know of Deathworm? After more than nine years of dealing with only his goons, I'm starting to wonder if he actually exists. But yeah, you could say I know of him. Ah, Deathworm exists, my friend. But not for long if I have my way. His way, he explained, was to fight. A former professional mixed martial arts expert out of South Africa, Shaka told me he'd been a fighter his whole life and a winner. He was a favorite to win the next world champ until Deathworm's thugs kidnapped him one night after a bout in Korea. They caught him off guard and, exhausted after the five hard rounds he'd just fought inside the arena, like me, 
he was brought to this place, berated, microchipped, nearly drowned, and then thrown inside the fence with no idea of what the hell was going on. Shaka said he immediately began looking for a way to escape. But then, We've got a runner! One of the humans tries to escape by, by throwing his shirt over the barbed wire to go out. Let's hit the brakes! <laughs> we see that half of their face actually explodes off on either side. Shaka understood what the microchip was for, which meant escape wasn't an option. Leaving me one choice that made sense. Survive long enough to be freed or die trying. Wait, freed? How? He says. The cage fight tournament. Names are randomly drawn. Humans fight humans and mutants, as you called yourself, fight mutants. Single elimination. Emphasis on elimination, right? Yeah. Die fighting or die by remote detonation. We live and train here, but not for much longer. Boss Finn runs a traveling tournament. Rumor is we'll begin moving west soon, in the final fight in the Ukraine. Last human versus the last mutant battling for the big prize. Freedom? Exactly. And freedom for me means I can hunt down and kill my real enemy. Death Worm. Makes the choice to fight or die a lot easier, doesn't it, brah? Easier? Not the word I would have used. We hear Leo's voice, an honor check. That's what it is. You made oaths, and now you have to decide if you want to keep them. More like Ultimate Catch-22 if you ask me. I mean, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, Mikey. You guys always overcomplicate things. It ain't about honor, and it ain't about getting damned. Sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. Simple as that. I see him sleeping on his bunk bed. And so, I did. For two years, as Boss Finn's gladiator circus traveled west, I fought, and I killed, and I won. We see him fighting some of the mutants, and then standing victorious. I did what I had to to survive. And now, in the barracks, he seems to be alone. Simple as that. It was the same for Shaka. As our individual kill list grew, we talked about our past. I told him about my ninja family, and he told me about his Swahili ancestry. It is why Finn dressed me up like some ancient African warrior in the cage. Ups the entertainment value, she says. Entertainment, right. We told each other everything we lost. So your path for revenge to this scum Hiroto leads through Deathworm because of a promise you made? Something like that. Though, things have gotten way more personal with Deathworm over the last few years. I know the feeling. I only lost a career and maybe some prize money to go with it when they stole me into this mad tournament. But your entire family and all your friends? As much as I want a pound of flesh, I don't want to be the one who stops you from getting yours, brah. And we talked about the future. Makes having to kill you tomorrow way more complicated. I know the feeling. But we made our choice. Yeah. I hate this, Shaka. You're not alone, my friend. And the future is now. Back to them fighting in the cage. We show that Michelangelo has Shaka in a headlock, and they're trying to jockey for position. The judo throw, Shaka throws him onto the ground. Urf, you heard Boss Finn, bra. Kill or be killed. And these showlies want a show. He goes and picks up a hatchet. Michelangelo picks up a uh, spiked mace. Crap. And blocks it just in time. Let's give them one. Best get the bets right quick, ladies and blokes. We got a real Donnybrook here. Please, I can't do this. You won't have to, brah. Just promise me one thing, he says to him. When you get your plound of fresh, get some for me, too. As he throws the axe and it hits Finn in the side of the arm, causing a gash. Yeah! What the? Shaka, why? Just making a noble choice, my friend. Kill the bastard, she says. Then with a tap of a button, his neck explodes with a... <laughs> no! No! Shaka's dead on the ground, Michelangelo staring over him, with the turtles, the ghosts, staring on afterwards. The battle's over, Michelangelo lives, and Shaka dies. To be concluded. And that's the end of The Lost Years, issue number four. It's pizza time. And now, in a segment that we call Pizza Time, where we discuss any Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle or pizza-related food, I give you pizza time. It's your pizza time for today. One of my favorites, the very simple yet very delicious margarita pizza for the dough. Three and three quarters cups all-purpose flour, plus more for dusting. One and one half seasons fine salt. One and one third cups warm water. One tablespoon of sugar. One quarter ounce packet active dry yeast. Three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, plus more for brushing. For the pizza, one can crushed San Marzano tomatoes, one half teaspoon dried oregano, kosher salt and freshly ground pepper, extra virgin olive oil for drizzling, one half pound of mozzarella cheese diced, 
Torn fresh basil for topping. Step 1. To make the dough, whisk the flour and fine salt in a large bowl. Make a well in the middle and add the water, sugar, and yeast. Let it sit until foamy, and then mix in the olive oil. Stir in the dry ingredients into the wet ingredients to make a shaggy dough. Turn out on a floured surface and knead until the dough is smooth for about 5 minutes. Brush with more olive oil, transfer to a clean bowl. Cover and let rise until doubled in size, about one and a half hours. Meanwhile, place a pizza stone or inverted baking sheet on the lowest rack of the oven and preheat to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Step 2. Divide the dough into two balls. You'll only need one ball of dough for these pizzas. Refrigerator freeze the other dough for use. Divide the remaining dough into two pieces. Stretch each piece into a 9 inch round on a floured pizza peel or a large wooden cutting board or a piece of parchment paper. Step 3. Make the pizzas. Spread the tomatoes on the dough. Top with oregano. Season with kosher salt and pepper and drizzle with olive oil. Slide the pizzas, the parchment if using, onto a hot stone. Bake until the crust is golden, about 15 minutes. Step 4. Sprinkle the pizzas with mozzarella, basil, salt, and pepper. Continue baking until the cheese melts. Drizzle with more olive oil. Pro tip, margarita pizza is usually topped with crushed tomatoes instead of sauce. Use good quality canned tomatoes. Don't expect full cheesy coverage on a margarita. It's generally topped with pockets of diced mozzarella cheese. A drizzle of olive oil is the perfect final pizza topping, and it goes with every kind of pie. Drizzle right before serving. And that's your pizza recipe of the day, margarita pizza. Cowabunga, dudes! Thank you for listening to the Epic Tales from the Sewers podcast. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. This podcast has no affiliation with Eastman, Laird, Mirage Studios, IDW Studios, Archie Comics, or Nickelodeon Studios. This podcast is a member of the Dorkening Podcast Network. Check out thedorkening.com for other podcasts. Epic Tales from the Sewers is recorded by Justin Cooper and Eric Will. Casey Jones from Casey Jones Livewire, and you're listening to Epic Tales from the Sewers. Time for a knuckle sandwich, punk. Everyone thinks because you're a zombie, you don't know good coffee. Well, they're wrong. We have very active lifestyles. It's not all wandering the countryside aimlessly or scaring passing motorists. And we all love a good cup of joe. And there's only one brew that gets my seal of approval. Deadly Grounds Coffee is my guilty pleasure. Bold. Robust. Delicious. It's coffee that can wake the dead. <laughs> With over a dozen different roasts and flavors, Deadly Grounds can satisfy the most finicky of coffee addicts. The aroma is so intoxicating. It brings all of my neighbors out of the woodwork. Deadly Grounds coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. It's good to get a little deadly. It took me 10 years to make the perfect man cave. And then we took it over. And we made it into the multiversal chamber. Then I started my own podcast. And we took that over too. And we're the co-host, the Multiverse Kids. Yeah, and I'm the dad, the geeky dad. And every week, we what? We review the movies, shows, and books, games, and toys. Yeah, 
and sometimes we even have a special guest. So, join us every week on the Geeky Dad Podcast. Greetings and Shabibans. We are the Retro Reductibus Cephala Podcast, a long-form bi-weekly show that celebrates all the things that made growing up awesome. Yeah, that sounds good, but I don't know what all those words mean. I think what Parasite seems trying to say is that on Retro Reductibus, we explore a range of retro goodness, from toys, video games, and movies, to cartoons, and even snacks and school lunches. Oh. And we do it all with a positive spin, a slew of killer guests, and some <clears throat> very adult language. And you know what else is cool? No. Nope. This crazy show is part of the Dorking Podcast Network with new episodes every technical Tuesday. It's there. And if waiting two weeks for a new episode gives you a sad, know that we drop bonus episodes all the time, like the off-format Crow's Nest and an interview series we call The Brick. You can listen to Retro Doctopus on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or any app that's cool enough to carry the only show that celebrates all the things that make growing up awesome. Hello, Intrepid listeners. This is the Generation Playlist Podcast, a podcast about music where we are your guides through a particular group or artist. We talk about the music, and then we make a customized playlist to share with you, our listeners. And you can check us out wherever you listen to podcasts and find our playlists on Spotify. Spotify. 